Maddie, thank you very much, Matt Dunstone, for uh, taking the time to talk to us a little bit here. There's lots to talk about. Um, but first, let's start with how you started curling. Let's start, let's go back to when you started. How old were you? How did you get into it and why? Yeah, uh, you know, just like most, it, it kind of ran in the family. My dad was a competitive curler, uh, played with Mark Olson, Peter Nichols, um, you know, so I didn't have much of a choice. My my grandparents as well were, were competitive curlers uh, back in, in their day as well. So, um, you know, just it was a family affair. Um, I was about four years old, I guess, was kind of the first time I was on the ice. Um, you know, didn't go too well. I ended up falling and a, a wood broom knocked me in the nose and I had a bloody nose on the ice, but you know, I kept coming back, <laughs> kept coming back for more. Um, and you know, I just fell in love with the sport. Um, you know, anywhere my dad was playing, you know, you'd, you'd see me behind the glass watching, um, whether, or, or watching my, uh, grandparents, 1980 Canadian mixed final tape on TSN. I've, you know, I watched that, uh, <laughs> watched that over and over and over. And, um, you know, it's, uh, just something, something I've grown up with, loved it right away. Um, and it's, it's my whole life's been surrounded by it. Uh, so when it comes to kids, we get it. And so you grew up the same as me, my dad grew up in the family and so on, but a lot of kids are getting into our sport that don't come from backgrounds of, of, uh, a family that curled. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is like, how do we make it easier to get kids into the clubs and then get them out from the club, having fun on the Saturday afternoon at one o'clock into the semi competitive U15 things and growing up into U18 and junior and so on, but just make it a little easier for the kids to get involved. I think it might even start with trying to get, make it a little easier for their parents to get involved. I mean, the, with, with the curling clubs, it's, it's a large commitment, um, you know, to, to throw down $500 to become a member of a club and have to commit to a certain, certain time, certain night of every single week. Um, that's just not how, how things particularly work nowadays. Um, so I'd really love to see sort of an atmosphere where it's just to show up and play. You, you, you throw 20 bucks down and you get the ice for an hour and kind of more, make it more like a bowling alley, um, where there's just not that commitment. Um, and I, and I think, the, you get more older people in, involved in it, and then ultimately that's how they get their kids going again. Um, so that's I kind of see it starting there first. Um, wow, that's a that's a big change to a curling club because it's always been if you're the men's league, you curl Tuesday night from seven till nine thirty every Tuesday. Damn it, <laughs> that's yes. just what you do, and that, you can't change the club, Matt. For goodness sakes. Well, and that worked great many years ago. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's the recipe to, to be bringing people in. Um, the amount of conversations I've had with people my age, young 20s, um, teenagers, like the amount of people that have said to me, you know, I'd, I'd love to try curling. Watched you on TV a couple times. Um, you know, it looks fun. Heard heard people like to tip them back every now and then at the spiels. Like that's something I'd love to be a part of, but I don't know where to start. And you know, for, for me, um, like for that, that sort of age group, they don't want to pay the 500 bucks in a mat for a membership and, and things like that. They, they want to go, they want to pay their 20 bucks. They want to go have a couple drinks, cheap drinks upstairs and, you know, have a good time with their friends. Um, so I, I just think we got to try and make it more accessible, um, and more affordable for, for these sort of younger people. Um, and again, like I said, you, you get, you get, sort of those young adults and um that sort of thing into the sport that's that's when you get the younger the the five six year old kids into it again when they start having kids so if we're gonna i, I and i of course you know i agree wholeheartedly with you i was joking with the other part but um when you get these ideas of just showing up at the club and and paying your your one-time fee not a not a yearly fee yeah. um do you think that four-person curling is the strongest or what game do you think that there's other options that we could have with um, with new people coming into the club? I, uh, you know, I think doubles is, is a great way to, to go about it. Um, you know, I haven't played in a men's league or anything like that in 10, 15 years, um, but I have played in a doubles league. Me, me and my girlfriend, Aaron, we joined a doubles league in Kamloops a couple of years back and played Monday nights. Obviously, I didn't make too many games, but <laughs> but we, we tried to play Monday nights. Um, and, you know, it's just easier to get, get people to, get one person to commit to something as opposed to three other people, right? I mean, um, you, you try and play slow pitch and you need 15, 16 people because people have other things going on. They can't commit to the Tuesday night slow pitch league every every single week, right? Um, and that's sort of the same thing with the four per. Don't get me wrong, I love the four-person game way more than any other kind of uh, 
um, game and curling. But um, it's just hard to get people to, to to commit to that, and it's it's just much easier trying to find one person, whether it be a spouse, partner, or just a single friend who's never curled before. Um, I think it's a lot easier to get them a single person to commit to to something like that. Well, I think that's the way of the world. I think you're right. Um, I haven't been part of a men's league in golf for. I don't even know when, because they're always a certain time of a certain day. Well, mm-hmm. my life doesn't work that way, and it just doesn't. And and uh, Shauna uh, has been in women's leagues forever, not for the last fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Can't do it. Just we, we travel a lot, and but we're, we're certainly the type of people that you want at the golf course because we like to have a cocktail before we go. We play the round of golf. We have dinner. We yeah. have, you know, yeah. like that. hot dog at the turn always. Uh, <laughs> always, always a hot dog <laughs> at the turn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so that's kind of the, the way I think we're looking at, at at curling going forward. I sure love the idea of, of dropping in, and if it's too busy, so you and I decide we're going to go down and, and play a game of triples at the local club. Great, yeah. bring a buddy with, and we're going to go down and play. And it's already full, like like it's already full for that that draw. And an hour later, there's two openings, so you sit and have a drink and wait an hour. Yeah. And if it's not, well, have dinner, like. Yeah. Whatever, like it, yeah. I, I, people worry too much. I think about the, uh, the 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 league, the word. I guess is that fair? Like, yeah, and you know the kind of way I always think about it too is like if if I'm sort of not an avid golf, like I, I I get a golf membership because I try and get thirty forty rounds a season, that sort of thing. Like I just I'm not good at it, but I love golf, and so I, a membership makes sense for me. But for somebody who only golfs two three times a year, like if their only way to get on the golf course was buying a membership, they're not going to pay two, three grand for three rounds of golf, right? And curling's kind of the same thing on a smaller scale. Um, so I, I've kind of thought like, and, and only so many clubs can do this, but do, do clubs allocate two, three of their sheets for drop-in only and their leagues are cut down to three, four sheets and that's just what the leagues are now. Yeah, I, I, well, that's a certain something to think about. Uh, the juniors not being on TV this year, the junior finals. Uh thoughts on that because you were a junior champion of course yeah it uh i was sad um kind of kind of watching that um just knowing like it's juniors is still kind of fresh i'm only seven years out of it and you know it was on tsn it was it was a huge deal um you know just kind of growing up like it was on a sunday night always you know it 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 had that briar feel briar feel to it um and you know it you'd get together with a bunch of friends if you weren't playing in the junior final obviously like I remember getting together with a bunch of friends and we'd treat it like a Super Bowl or whatever it was we'd gather around and, and watch uh what was one, one of them I remember Brendan Wark and, and Brendan Botcher in, in 2012 I remember getting together with a bunch of buddies and watching that and um it was played on a Friday afternoon this year and at both finals were at the same time so I I was sad um I I guess is the best way to put that um you know those those junior days are are huge for for to keep some keep some of these curlers going um and I just don't I don't think it's it's a good way to keep them going when we're playing a junior final on the on a Friday afternoon and and both of them aren't even being televised so let's get into some adult curling but I did want to talk to you about all the junior stuff because I know how passionate you are about it yeah uh so let's get into some adult stuff with uh let's talk about the length of events. Uh, we just got done watching uh, uh, Nick and, and, and Brad play 15 games. Um, had Ten Tab of them th- were meaningless. <laughs> really. <laughs> and Tab Tab was just here, and she played yep. 16 in the bubble. Um, your thoughts on on uh, crowning a champ quicker um, in, in curling generally overall, not just worlds. Please. <laughs> like, it's, what do you think? It's, tell, tell me. Tell me like, it's, nobody's – well – between you and I, who one of one of us is the biggest curling nerd. I just don't know which one of us. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you think? It's nuts. Um, the world championship, in particular, to qualify six teams after a twelve game round robin, and then sort of the whole playoffs. I mean, to to play fifteen games, and I didn't pay too close to a, or too close attention to the actual schedule of it. But I thought a lot of teams were playing back to back games, and to do that over the course of eight nine days whatever it is like that's really hard on 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 curlers um there's really no need um for for people to have to play 12 to 15 games to to crown a champion in in an event with with 12 teams in it it just it doesn't make make a whole lot of sense to me um and you know the the time time away from home as it is it it continues to get more and more um for all the curlers as, as more and more events like this sort of pop up um we we, we got to shorten up shorten up events that's a no-brainer um so let's get into the residency rules um you're curling back out of manitoba this year yeah um 
and you can talk about your new team. I'd love to hear about it. But the residency rules and how did that affect your decision making, or did it, or does it? Like that's kind of what I need to know with uh, with how when you go to build a new team, how do you do it? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I think the big thing was I think the big thing is having comfort in knowing that you could pick from all over the place. I think that would be the one argument for getting rid of the residency rules is just ha- knowing that I could pick this person from there, pick that person from here, and this opportunity to make this team could happen. On the flip side, I mean, I, I think more now than ever before, it's Im- important and imperative for teams to be able to practice together on a more consistent basis. Um, so in, in our scenario in particular, residency rules didn't come into play at all. Um, the, the team was made just simply on what we thought would be the, the best scenario. Um, but I think kind of having the, knowing that maybe you could make a team that didn't necessarily play within these sort of rules, um, I think maybe provides a little bit more comfort. Um, and I know every, every scenario is different, but in our scenario, the residency so rules do come new, to play. who's on the new team and, uh, and, and what assets are they bringing? Like, why did you put this crew together? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, BJ Newfeld's playing third, um, Colton Lott at second, um, and then Ryan Harnden, Harnden at lead. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to, to be able to play with, with a bunch of guys who throw exactly like you, um, which I know is something you were high up on when you made, when you made your teams as well. So. Um, you know, when it comes to trying to throw the same stone and, and take a bunch of the guesswork out, like when it when it comes to me, the other two guys in the sport that are exactly like that are BJ Newfeld and Colton Lott. And, um, you know, it, it uh, didn't really expect um, Brad to step back for a year or two like he did. So that's where Ryan came into play. Um, and you know, this whole team change stuff moves. <laughs> it's like wildfire. I mean, you, you blink and suddenly all these teams are made and it's, it's crazy how fast it actually works. Um, but yeah, very, you know, I'm, I'm super pumped. I mean, I'm, I'm ecstatic for the world to see Colton Lott. Um, he's a special player. Um, he proved that at the Olympic trials this year to come in like he did. And he was the top third there and he was an absolute superstar. Um, and I, I think we have, a Canadian version of Oscar Erickson on our hands with him. I do. So 48 to 72 hours of, of, uh, curling's frenzy. Um, what's it like? What's, what, what, what goes on? Like, so so people can understand because it was chaos. It is chaos. Chaos is putting it nice. I mean, the briar ends Sunday, um, Monday morning, your, your phone starts ringing. That's kind of when it all starts. I mean, people kind of, every curler's different. And when they decide to start, um, kind of with this, the free agent frenzy and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not one to, to have any conversations prior to the Briar because, I mean, our, our team still had a goal of, of winning, especially coming as close as we did the last couple of years. We were, we were combined 10 inches away from being in two Briar finals the last couple of years. So, I mean, our goal was to, to go in there, give it everything we had and, and try and win the thing. Um, so it's it's Monday morning, your phone starts going and what are we doing here? Um, and, if I mean, if, if something catches your eye, then it's just, constant chatter back and forth and um you kind of just say okay well yeah I'd, I'd i'd like to play with you and then how but, are we going to finish Matt, this thing aren't off these people like, you're talking to aren't they talking to other people too like 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 it's tough it's tough you know until you sign the dotted line or or step on the ice with them in september it's hard to believe it's real because you're not signing contracts or anything like that right so i mean you don't you don't you don't really know and how all the other conversations are going um and then yeah it's it's a really tricky situation to manage right so let's talk about management so you you in 48 hours or some some really quick amount of time yeah. you get the new team together um and the season's actually not over yet yeah. this season yeah. is which is wild that there's going to be events you play with the old team but looking at it from a sponsorship point of view when you have this situation where now in, in we're in March, and and things are, are does that help you in in uh, in the sponsorship because now you got you have more time than if you do this in the summertime or late. how does it all I, how does that level out? I would say so for sure. I mean, the toughest part I find with with creating a new team is you kind of start from scratch with everything to do with outside of the curling. Like who's going to take care of the books? Who's going to book the travel? Who's going to put a sponsorship book together? Um, you kind of start right from scratch and and that's very time consuming. Um, and I mean, 
the more time you have to be able to do that and try and get out all your sponsorship and all that stuff locked in by July so you can get ready to go in August. I mean, it's it's a pretty quick turnaround. So um, I, I think the timing of when we do this probably makes sense, if not even earlier. I mean, you, it's tough to do it before the briar because the briar is what everybody like. You can't you can't do it before the briar, but if the briar was moved up, then you do it right after the briar, whenever that time might. Could we may set be. it up as a, as a timing uh, with the players' association to actually this is the time when if changes are going to be made, this is when we do it. Can we do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to blanket that. You know, I mean, you look at molding and botcher in December. Imagine if they had a time period. No, you guys can't break up. You got to like then it would have blown up in the two three months they had to stay together, right? Um, so it's tough because every scenario is so different. Um, but I kind of think the timing of it does work because you, you need so much time, um, especially with a, a brand new squad. It's different if you bring a single person in um, or whatever it may be. But when you start from scratch, four individuals come together and, and you got to begin to build everything again um, from the ground up. That takes a lot of time. So you're building the you're talking about the sponsorship book, the, the all of this stuff. So you're really how old are you now? Actually, 26, 26. Yeah. So you're just yeah, you're just getting going. Uh, where, where do you pick up the knowledge? Where do you learn? Who's, where's the resource to show you how to put a proper sponsorship package together, how to, to book media, how to do all these things that need to be done to promote your new team? It's, uh, it's tricky. It's a lot of trial and error. You, you don't really have those resources unless you go and search them out. Um, we've, uh, you know, I've been pretty fortunate over the last couple of years here. Um, Kirk Myers is, is someone who's world class when it comes to, to managing his sponsors. Um so I I've been very lucky to be able to learn a lot from him um and, and take take that forward with me. <coughs> Sorry with me. Um and you know I, I think um the more hired hands you can actually get on a team to to help you with that sort of thing. True professionals. Um and, and our team's already been lucky enough to to hire one already um to to manage our PR and reach out to media outlets and, and that sort of thing. That's huge because I mean the the curling part is tough enough as it is. Um playing all the world class teams and trying to be on your game for that. But when you're trying to manage getting into a new place and setting up a bunch of media interviews and that sort of thing. Like that's just the added layer of stuff that a curler does not need if they want to be on the top of their game come event time. So um, we're definitely looking into to hiring um, some people to, to work on, to, to do this sort of thing for us. So at your age, I think the, uh, an obvious question I need to ask you is with the length of the season um, and looking at the, I know you and I have talked about this on the phone, just, just, <laughs> just one-on-one about, um, what Curling Canada does with, with their events, a World Curling Federation with their events, and Grand Slam, of course, with their events, Grand Slam being best of the best, yeah. uh, World Championships being five, four, five, six teams-ish um, yeah. who, who legitimately could win the event, and then other teams that can't, yeah. which is fine. They're growing, they're getting better, that's mm-hmm. all good. I don't think that should change, by the way. I, I, I think it's great. But there's got to be a middle road in there somewhere, I, I believe. There has to be where... Countries that have a superstar like uh, uh, Nicodine, and we don't know, I don't know who the second best team is in Sweden because they've never been to anything that I've seen because they can't. Yeah. They got a, this, this giant that can't, uh, because they can't beat. But if we had a, a, an event that you and I have talked about before, World Cup style, where you can have three teams from a country if your country is lucky enough to have that kind of depth. From your age group, an event like that, uh, is that something that you think is a good idea? Um, a World Cup style event or events um, be able to uh, attract the young curler into the limelight maybe maybe sooner? I'd, I'm always in for something like that. I mean, the World Cups we had a couple of years ago, Those we were lucky enough to play in two of those, and those were amazing events. Um, you know, it's kind of funny with how regionalized curling is it's like no other sport on the planet you 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 even watching the olympics like cross-country skiing you got four skiers from norway in the event and you don't have another country represented like it, whereas curling it's every country every province is always represented regardless of the skill level where a bunch of other sports it's world championships the best of the best kind of regardless of what country they're from if if norway's got the best cross-country skiers they're all of them are in there you know so um I, I think that's also on the flip side. I'm going to contradict myself here. That's also what makes curling unique and and beautiful in its own way. Um, that you that you sort of get that. Um, so when it comes to that sort of thing, like 
I, I have a, it's a tough one to answer. Um, it's what I love about the slams is it because it is the best of the best. Like it is your top 15, 16 teams, whatever it is, it's black and white. These are the best of the best. And that's why I find the slam so special because it, it truly is your best teams. It is the hardest event to win. One more thing before I let you go. Um, playoff systems in all these various events. Um, they're very different. When you come to an event, do you actually have to look at the rules to see, okay, well, wait a minute, what, what are the playoffs here? You do, uh, you do more now than ever before. Um, you know, I, I definitely make sure I'm, I'm well aware of the player's guide and how everything looks. Because um, every event's different, and every event's different every year, it seems. Um, event formats are changing um, all the time. Um, you know, it's, I, I understand in, in certain scenarios why changes have to be made. Um, but, you know, a little bit, a little bit of consistency, more so, I would say not on the actual formats themselves, just when it comes to the, the playoff format, like who's getting hammer and when and why that's, that's the one for me that changes a lot, um, for no real rhyme or reason, um, and not a good reason for in certain scenarios why why someone would get hammer over the other, why someone doesn't get hammer over the other in a playoff game. Um, I, I think having that a little bit more clear, cut and dry um, makes a little would make our lives a little bit easier. Do uh, does the game? I, I, I didn't. I thought that was going to be my last question, but it's not. Um, when it comes to hammer. It's really becoming, especially at the on perfect ice in the, in, in in both women's and men's, but men's especially, uh, really becoming a bigger than a seven percent advantage. It used to be fifty seven to forty three. I think it's bigger than that now. Yeah. Uh, if you have the hammer, is there some reason why the game has to have just like if you win the hammer, you get the hammer in the first end? Is there any reason why we can't have a choice between you can have their hammer in the first half or the second half? Yeah, I've kind of thought about that a bit. Um, I don't think there's a necessarily perfect way to do that. Um, what would be the negative part? The negative part of it? Um, I guess you got to try it out before you can find a negative. I think for me to to say an idea doesn't make sense, wouldn't, wouldn't be fair of me to say without actually trying it out. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always in for trying out new things with our sport. I'm actually, I'm running an event next week. Um, called the be- SGI Canada Best of the West. It's for for U30 curlers, and it starts Friday Friday morning next week. Um, we're, we're, we're doing in we're, Saskatoon, Nutana Curling Club in Saskatoon, um, and we're doing a fun thing. Um, so we got men's, women's, and doubles, and this doubles is going to be same gender doubles. So it's two men and then two females, um, and they're going to be in separate pools. And it's actually going to be six rocks instead of five. So teams are going to be throwing two, 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 and then one, one. Um, so the, the two, the two pools are going to play each other in the pools and then eventually we're gonna have a men, uh, a men's double team play a women's double team in the final. So, I mean, I'm always in for, for trying new things. I'm super excited to see how that sort of plays out with six rock doubles. And, um, so for me to, to come and say that, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of an idea without sort of trying it, um, wouldn't be very fair. So I'm, I'm always in to try something like that. And, um, you know, maybe I, I can find a negative in it and as to, to maybe why, but. I'm always in for trying something new, trying to make the, the sport more exciting. Um, you know, the more I think about drawing for, draw to the button to, to close a game instead of an extra end, that, like a, a huge problem we have is, is tied up in the eighth end or tied up in the 10th or tied up in the extra as the most boring end in curling. Any other sport, you get down to crunch time, it's the most exciting part in the sport, right? And that, whether it be a draw to the button, I don't know what, maybe you play two ends and each team gets one hammer. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but you got to make those last couple ends more exciting as well because those are, those are snooze fests. It's peel, peel, peel until someone draws the, draws the 12 foot most of the time for the win. <laughs> well, luckily there's no tick now at the Worlds and, and here at, at, uh, at the Players as well. And, yeah. cha- and Champions Cup, I believe, is going to go with the no tick as well. So, yeah. so we'll see if that makes a difference on a little bit of excitement in the last ends. Absolutely. Well, Matt, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. And, and good luck with your event. I did not know that for next week. So Yeah, I'm very excited I'll, about I'll it. I'll be definitely very cool. paying attention. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it'll <laughs> be, we got uh, stream team coming in to, to showcase it all, and it's going to be on YouTube and Curling Zone <laughs> and all that sort of thing. It's going to be awesome. Good. Very excited Congratulations. about it. Congratulations. Uh, yeah.